All right, what are we preaching about tonight? The title of my sermon is called Biblical Christian Discipline. And um, what, what I want to help explain is, is how to appropriately deal with people inside and outside of the church, mostly within the church, though, and, and with how um, the right protocol, the right spirit, the right attitude, the, the, the right actions that we take, depending on a, whatever the situation is. There's many different situations that, that people might find themselves in, and there's, there's different um, levels of, of discipline meted out, whether it be um, you know, the church judging things, people getting kicked out of church, you know, whatever the case may be, if the person is, is a, a public figure, if the person is a teacher, if they're a false prophet, if they're a heretic, if they're, you know, there's, there's, there's many different situations we find ourselves in. And um, I, I think there's a lack of, of knowledge or understanding on what's appropriate for the, the various situations that may come up. And we're going to look at Scripture. We're going to see what the, what the Bible says. I mean, this is our final authority, you know. There, there's people do all kinds of different things. You have all kinds of different teachers out there. And, and I mean, people want to take a lot of liberty. But we've got God's word, and this is what we're going to follow. And this is what we're going to model everything after. And uh, we're going to look at this tonight. And we're starting off in Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to start at like a, what I consider to be like a low level, like personal relationships, problems that arise between people in the church, that's not necessarily a, you know, a, a getting up into the hierarchy. And, and you know, it, it's not a big surprise I'm preaching a sermon right now. This is, this is kind of in response to what I've been seeing happening ever since Pastor Anderson fired Tyler Baker from being a deacon. And I've seen a fallout and I've seen all kinds of things happen that, um, to be honest with you, is, is, a little, is, is pretty disturbing. But not necessarily for the reasons that you think. So let me, I'm going to start off by stating that I agree with what Pastor Anderson did and with his approach and with making public what, what he said. And, and I, am, I am completely on board with the, with, the, with the way things were executed from him personally and from the church and from the people involved there that actually knew what was going on and had firsthand knowledge of things. That was dealt with appropriately. So I am not coming up to the defense of Tyler Baker or anything like that because I don't support him. I believe what he taught was heresy and, and is really bad and not some minor issue at all. I mean, I'm like no bones about it. Like this is, this is no doubt about it. You know, I'm, I am not, this is not a defense of him at all. And actually some of the things I'm going to be talking about has more to do with, with really other things. It's not people coming to defend him or, or whatever. That has nothing to do with it. This has to do with just how are things dealt with appropriately? And one of the things I saw were people who were criticizing the way, what Pastor Anderson did used this passage of script, Scripture in Matthew chapter 18 and saying, oh, you didn't deal with it the way that you know, the Bible says you ought to deal with problems in the church. Well, we're going to look at a lot of different areas because there's not just one passage in the Bible that just talks about the way everything is dealt with within the church. There's not. There's many things. There's many places talking about specific situations that come up. Now, the overseer definitely has the, 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 the final authority of the way things are run within the church. And when it comes to another position that's an ordained deacon within the church, I think it's a pastor's duty and responsibility to, when you see things happen of that nature, that you don't, you don't need, you know, the witnesses, everything was established, you don't need the approval of everybody else within the church to make the decision to cut that person and to sever ties with them and to treat them, you know, to mark them and avoid them for their teaching. That is actually completely appropriate and biblical. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. Now, we're starting off, though, in Matthew 18 here because this is dealing with, and we're going to start reading in verse number 15, discipline within the church. And we're going to look at also when it's appropriate to break fellowship with people. Because look, and, and this isn't a problem 
for people breaking fellowship when it's somebody that you don't like anyways, right? <laughs> Someone who you don't normally fellowship with anyways, it's just kind of like, okay, well, whatever, you know. But when it's someone that maybe is your friend, when it's someone that you've, you've had a good relationship with, that's when it be, can, can become difficult. But see, we've got to decide who you love more. Do you love God most or do you love your friend more, you know? And there's, you know, the Bible says, you know, there's a, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother and things like that. Yeah, you ought to be good friends, but not when it contradicts Scripture, not when it talks about when, when someone actually needs to be disciplined or chastised for things that they've done wrong that are bad enough to, to, to come before a church and actually be a problem, okay? So look at verse number 15 here. We'll just jump into the Scripture, Matthew 18. The Bible says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, He's not talking to a pastor, you know, like to some authority structure. He's just talking about with, within, amongst believers, if your brother does you wrong, sins against you personally, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And in this story, what he's bringing up, he's already establishing like who's in the wrong here. He says, if thy brother trespasses against thee. So you personally have been wrong. Someone has trespassed against you. And because this is a hypothetical situation, you're just saying, look, if someone has done you wrong, and obviously it's legitimate because he's saying they have done the wrong to you, the first thing that you do within the church is you just go and talk to him. And he wants it being confronted. You say, well, I don't like confrontations. Yeah, but either forgive them right away, but if it's a problem for you, you don't want to have things festering and building up and getting resentment and bitterness towards other people when someone's done you wrong, they said something about you, you know, oftentimes things are misinterpreted, someone insults you, you know, you, you don't carry that stuff with you. If, someone, if you believe someone's done you wrong and it's a real problem for you and you, you have a hard time getting past that, approach them and just confront them about it and try to resolve the conflict just between the two of you. Why? Because it really shouldn't have to be anybody else's business. You don't go talking about them with other church men. Oh, can you believe so-and-so did this to me and start being a gossip and a busybody and getting other people involved in matters that aren't theirs? You just deal with it personally. You know, there used to be a time when people actually valued privacy and, and handled matters in a private fashion, in a private nature appropriately Nowadays, it's like with all the cameras everywhere and the internet and cell phone videos and everything, it's like people are just publishing their entire life for the whole world to see and airing all their dirty laundry, all of the problems that they have with everybody ever just for the whole world to see, and it's disgusting. It really is. I'm sick of, I'm sick of seeing people. It's such a perverted, weird culture that we live in today. Where things, you know, you ought to be able to deal with things, you know, at home or in your family, like within your family. You don't need to go telling everyone else about your problems. And if you have a problem with someone, and this is what he's saying in the church, you got your brother does you wrong. And we're talking about a brother. This is someone who's another believer. You are brethren in Christ. And don't forget that either. You, you don't always have to like um, personally, like, like, like want to hang out all the time. But you have to love your brethren. Right. I mean, Jesus commanded us to love one another as he loved us. Right. You know, they, you may not have the same personality and have all the same interests and want to go hang out after church. It doesn't matter. You still have to love that person. And then and if, if a, com, a conflict arises, the first method is to just go to them individually and deal with the, with the problem. And see, this is what's stupid already when people say, oh, see, Pastor Anderson didn't deal with it, you know. First of all, Tyler didn't sin against Pastor Anderson. It wasn't something that he did specifically to him. He's, he was teaching heresy in a position of as, as an elder within the church. That is not what Jesus is talking about here at all. He's talking about some squabble, some dispute. So, you know, oh, I, you did work for me and you didn't pay me or whatever. Someone has actually done you wrong individually, personally. He says, just, just fix it yourself. He says, okay, if that doesn't work, what do we do? Verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Says, okay, your next step is you're still trying to settle this thing and, and keep it low key. So you bring a couple people 
right? Just to establish that they're going to listen. You're going to explain. Here's what's going on. Here's what he did to me. No, I didn't do that. You know, so that way the whole story can be heard by witnesses who can now say, I heard him say this and him say that, you know, and verify what is being claimed. And then also to be able to, to help with the judgment too. Like, okay, here's a couple witnesses. Yeah, this is, you know, you're right, you're wrong, whatever. And then it says in verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, because why is it them? Because the two or three witnesses are telling the guy who did the wrong that he's wrong, right? The brother that did wrong unto the other brother. The two or three witnesses, they hear the whole story and they're saying, yeah, you know, like you're, you're wrong. You know, you gotta, you gotta make this right or whatever. And he said, nope, I'm not wrong. I'm not, you know, someone is just, just refusing to hear now other people, it says in verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. So he said, the next step up is you deal with them one-on-one, -on -one, you deal with it with a couple people, and now it's got to the point if he's just, not, just refusing to hear and just is adamant that no, I'm not wrong or whatever, then he says, okay, you're going to bring it to the church and the church is going to make a decision and decide who's right and who's wrong and what's the proper judgment. And this is the way that God designed things to be managed within the church. This is a body. We are, we are a group of people here. We're an organized body here to serve Christ, the body of Christ, to, um, to do his will. And God has ordained a certain authority structure within the church and mechanisms to handle problems. We don't just go outside of the church to handle all of our disputes and stuff. That's wicked. Is that wrong? We're going to get to that in a little bit in 1 Corinthians. But he says here then, if it goes all the way to the church and the church makes a decision, I mean, every, you know, they have the vote, say, this is, you know, this is who we determine, we right or wrong, whatever. So if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now, when you met, when you, when it's saying there to let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican, he's basically saying, have nothing to do with them. Because you shouldn't be making friends and being buddies with the heathen of the world. You, you go and preach the gospel to them, right? But what's the point of preaching the gospel to somebody who's already a brother? He's already a brother. So when you treat him as a heathen, heathen as a publican, you're saying, I'm not going to fellowship with you anymore. And this, is what, and this is what happens. And he says in verse 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And this is real interesting because he's basically just saying that you know what? I have given this authority and judgment unto you, church. This is, a, this, is a, this is one aspect where God just says, you know what? You decide, and whatever you decide, I'll go by. Like, that's what God goes by based off of the judgment of the church. He says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So when the person refuses to, to, to hear the authority of the church, God says, well, it's a, you know, I, I have given this authority of the church. And he says, that's... that's That stands by God. And then jump down to verse number 21. So this is the way things, this is just the way things ought to be handled when someone does you wrong within the church. Real simple, right? Not that big of a deal. Now, when you treat them as a heathen man or a publican, before I even move on, does that mean you just start blasting this person? Nope. And just publicly just throw, you know, this person did me wrong for the whole world to see and try to ruin their life and get a whole bunch of people to gang up on them and just rebuke, 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 rebuke. Is that what the Bible's saying ought to be done to this person that you just keep on hammering it down until they repent and you just keep on beating them down and break them down to the ground until they finally say they're sorry? Is that the spirit we ought to have in, in dealing with, with this person who did wrong? Absolutely not. He says, fine. If he doesn't want to hear it, just treat him like a heathen. I mean, every heathen out in the world, do you just go after every heathen? Of course not. Why would you? It's a waste of time. That's right. And you shouldn't be doing that in this situation either. You just worry about, you know what? God, God understands the authority. And if he's refusing to hear the authority given by the church, then God's going to deal with it. It's no longer in your hands. You just say, okay, I'm just breaking fellowship with you. We're not going to, I'm not, you know, we're not going to have anything to do with you. And the church is going to kick him out and say, 
If you're not going to listen to the authority of the church, then get out of here. You're not going to be a part of this church. Because you're not subscribing even that, that the church has this authority. If you're not recognizing the authority that God's given to us, then you are not going to stay here. Get out. But it doesn't mean you have to just continually rail so that everybody in the whole world knows about this wrong that you did, you know, whatever. And he said that actually the proper spirit to have in a situation like this when someone does you wrong is not to just make a big deal out of it, but rather just to, to forgive them. Now look at, but there's an important distinction here too. I want to jump down to verse number 21. Because obviously there has to be a means, not everything, you know, some things have to be settled. You know, when someone does you wrong, like you, you might, you really might need to be like recompensed. If someone's damaged your property and it's like, it's really important and you can't even fix it yourself, you know, whatever. It's just kind of like, look, you need to take care of this and fix this for me because you did wrong. You know, now the best example would be to still be able to, to forgive and let things go. But, you know, God has given us this completely legitimate option to follow things that way. And that it's not, you're not like somehow in the wrong because you didn't just forgive them and not hold them responsible for what they did to you. So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with holding someone responsible for doing you wrong within the church. It just has to be done appropriately. But in, 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 in verse 21, it, you know, I wanted to... to clarify that because what we're going to read here in verse 21 actually has to do with somebody repenting and saying they're sorry. So in verse 21, the Bible says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So basically, and it's not in this passage, I think I'm thinking about in Luke or something where he said, um, you know, how oft shall my brother sin against me and, and repent, right? And I forg and, and forgive him. But um, even in this passage, he's saying, look, if your brother is sinning against you, he says, just forgive him. So seven times? No, not until seven times. It's 70 times seven. It's not like, let's count to 490 times. It's, <laughs> it's just a high number so that you just don't even worry about counting that high because just forgive your brother. That means your brother in Christ. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number six. We're going to see, again, more teaching on a brother doing wrong to another brother in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1, the Bible says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, Go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So keep in mind, this is the book of 1 Corinthians. So it's a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. So this is, this is directed at a church. And it's for the people. Hey, if someone does you wrong, if you have a matter against someone else within the church, he says, do you even, do you dare? Do you, are you really going to dare to go to the court system, to the world's court system, to go to law before the, the unjust and not before the saints? He's like, would you even consider doing that? Are you going to dare to do that? Verse number two, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matter? He's saying like, why in the world would you even consider going to this world's judges? To the heathen judges, to this world's judgment that's on a flawed system that many of them don't even believe God's word. They don't even believe the Bible. And you're going to trust them to execute justice in righteousness and a righteous recompense or whatever, you know, a, 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 a proclamation on, on what's going to be done and what's right. He's like, you have the truth. You've got the scripture. You know, this is, isn't there anybody that can judge? He's like, don't you know we're going to judge the, 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 the world? I mean, the saints are going to judge. They're going to judge angels. Like, like God has given us this position that we're going to be judging. Can you not even just judge the, the, the smallest of matters or the stupidest little things, Right. Involving some, some monetary value of whatever, like, like can't you just, just handle that? It's such a, a minor issue. Look at verse number three. 
Know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. You say if you have judgments, things pertaining to this life. Not spiritual things, but just stuff that happens in your day-to-day -day life. Things that happen between brethren, between people within the church. And it doesn't have to be specifically at church, but other brothers at, you know, from the church, outside, you know, if something happens outside of the church, someone invites you over to their house or whatever, and you have a, you have a disagreement or a fight, something happens and, and someone wrongs you in some way, the church can deal with that. Don't, basically what he's saying is don't sue your brother. Don't sue him at law and bring a court case against them and have some judge in, in the Arizona court system determine what's right and what's wrong. Sarah, sit down in your seat. Verse number five. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. He's saying like, what kind of a church are you? You don't even have one person that has some wisdom and knowledge and that can just make a righteous judgment and an issue. So I speak that to your shame. You ought, you ought to know God's word enough to be able to say, this is right and this is wrong. There ought to be one person in your church that can determine right from wrong. Verse number six, but brother goeth to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. So he's talking about just going to law, suing people, bringing them to court. And he's saying, why, you know, why are you doing that? Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. And again, we see this attitude of forgiveness, of saying, why don't you just take the wrong? Why don't you just, instead of even bringing it up and dealing with it within the church, just say, you know what? This guy did me wrong. He's my brother. He shouldn't have done that. But I'm just going to let it go. Because we don't need this division. We don't need this type of strife over some, something that doesn't really matter that much. Now, this is not referring to like some violent act like a rape or, you know, I mean, something very, very criminally serious like, you know, that, that someone, the, gov the, the governing authorities need to deal with and that God has ordained that in Romans 13, that power given to the governing authorities right. to execute judgment on the, on the evildoers. Right. This is talking about minor disputes within the church. And that should, I see a lot of that shaking, so this should be very obvious and clear that that is what this is talking about. And ultimately, those are the types of things you ought to be able to just say, you know what, fine. Whatever. It's just money. It's just my pride. It's just whatever. You know, don't don't worry about it. And then I'll flip back, if you would, to chapter 5 now. Because chapter 5 deals with some things that are a little bit more serious problems within the church, uh, uh, problems that arise with, with people getting into sin and, and how that is to be dealt with within the church. Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 6, deal with problems between church members. Someone does you wrong, don't bring them to court. Bring it up to the church, let the church set, settle the matter, and that's it. And the church has a final authority, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're kind of stepping it up a notch a little bit. Uh, verse number 1, the Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is, is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. There's a problem in the church of Corinth, and this person is in serious, I mean, this is a grievous sin. This is, this is a really disgusting sin, and he's saying, you guys are puffed up and you're not mourning. Like, you should be sad about it. Like, this, is, this is something that should, should really be eating you up, that this guy did this thing, Instead of just, hey, everything's great, you know, brother so-and-so's here with his new wife, you know, it's like <laughs> you're way far off in the, in the left field there with, uh, with their attitude towards this. And 
But let's keep reading. Verse number three. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done his deed. Paul's both saying, look, I've heard enough. I don't need to even be there to make a judgment on this issue. Like this is, this is so simple. What's going on here? How bad and how wrong this is? I've already made up my mind. I already know what the proper judgment is. Verse number four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now this is, this is good too because this also gives us some of the motivation for why there is breaking fellowship and what the purpose is of a person being shunned or a person being, you know, receiving this type of discipline. We're saying, look, I'm going to deliver up to Satan. Girls, sit still. Sit apart from each other right now. Opposite ends of the pews. Opposite ends. He's saying we're going to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So what he's doing is saying, you know, we want this guy's spirit to be saved, you know, and assuming this is an unbeliever, but he's saying we want this person to be saved, but in order for that to happen, I mean, this guy's got to be brought down. He's got to be brought low. He needs to go through this period of punishment to where we're just going to deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, because you know what? If a, if a man loses his, his right eye or his hand or whatever, and he doesn't go to hell, then praise God. I mean, whatever it is that it takes for, for this person to, um, to, to get right. Now, uh, but, you know, and I don't want to get into too, too far in depth of, well, what if the person's actually saved and stuff? I mean, what's he talking about then? I, I'm not even going to get into that because that's a whole other another area. The spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, verse number six, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So now he's also explaining that, you know, people like this and the grievous sins, like having his father's wife, is not to be tolerated within the church. There are certain things that are just not tolerated. We don't preach just tolerance of everything and every sin because what happens is it infects other people. And if there's no standards, then everybody's going to start just, well, why, you know, what's the point? It's kind of like having laws with no punishments. You know, I talk to people who don't believe there's a literal hell. But, the, you know, I talked to someone recently out soul winning that said, no, I don't believe hell's real. Okay, I said, well, do you believe the Bible? Yeah, I believe the Bible. Okay. You know, obviously someone who didn't know the Bible very well at all, but I tried to just, just reason with them and say, well, you know, do you know what sin is? And explain that, that sin is a transgression of a law. God, God has a law, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, what's the purpose of having a law if there's no punishment at all? I mean, if there's just, just no recompense, just we have this law and you need to follow it or else what? The law has no power. There's no effect to the law if there's no punishment associated with it. And I said, then why did Jesus, you believe that Jesus came and paid for the sins of the world? Oh, yeah. Why, why did he come and die then? If there's no punishment, if there's no hell, and, you know, and this person honestly said like, oh, well, I'll have to think about that. You know, I mean, it, they were just really ignorant and hadn't thought things through at all. So I'm not going to call them an idiot or, you know, stupid or whatever. I mean, it's obviously you're trying to win their soul I and mean, it's just giving them stuff to think about. But it was obviously they hadn't thought about it. And, um, but the whole, the whole point, though, is that, the, you know, there's a punishment to be paid. And he says here that... Um, You know, a little leaven's going to leaven the whole lump, and that's why we need to maintain a standard to be able to make sure that these people, you know, that, that people know there are consequences to your actions, that this church does have standards, and that when you break those standards, you're going to be kicked out. And ultimately, hopefully, it'll be for your benefit. You know, even if you have to deliver someone unto Satan for, you to, for the message to get through, it's better for you to, to have you know, temporary discomfort and problems and everything else in your life and then get right with God than to just pretend like everything's okay and let you continue down that path. Sometimes, you know, it's tough love is, is required. And that's why you spank your children because instead of just not dealing with it 
and just letting them do whatever they want, they need to understand, hey, there's consequences for your actions. It's a tough love. No one wants to see their child cry, but it's necessary. And people don't want to necessarily even sometimes break fellowship with a person, but you know what? It's necessary. If you really love that person, it, it can be very necessary. If they, if they get involved in some serious thing, we're going to look, we're going to see a little bit more of some, some other things that people can do to have the same type of a fate as this person did. But, um, you know, we, this, is, this is how you deal things within the church. So let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Now, I wasn't even going to cover this, but it needs to be covered. These are all very serious sins that the Bible lists here of saying not to even eat with people that are guilty, that, that someone that's called a brother, someone who's not ignorant, someone who should know better, to know the Bible, they're saved, they're called a brother, and they're involved in fornication. See, so, you know, we have a standard where we don't just let people to sleep around here. Someone's called a brother. It's not okay if you just sleep around with people. It's not acceptable. And we're not going to tolerate that behavior here. Or covetous, just always looking on and, and, and wanting other people's stuff and things that don't belong and having this covetous attitude, covetous heart. Or an idolater, of course, just, just wrapped up in idolatry. But look at this next one. Or a railer. A railer who's someone, and I've, pre I've preached an entire sermon about railing, usually it's associated with false accusations, but it's, it's not just the accusations, it's the, the, the hammering down perpetually and just railing on people and railing on people and railing on people as, as a, you know, just as the covetous, it's not like you have one thing that like you sinned and I wanted that, and I shouldn't have wanted that, and I said, you know, and you said something, oh, I wish I had that RV or something. But that's not, like, defining, or, or, or people wouldn't say, oh, you're a covetous person. Yeah, I sinned, I said something, I shouldn't have, it was kind of stupid, right? Because, I mean, everyone's going to have some type of sin. But um, and same thing with the railer. It's a similar type of a sin where it's like, yeah, I got angry at someone, and I, and I railed on them, you know. But if it's someone who's just railing and railing and railing and just loves to fight and that, you know, and the Bible says not to, not to even eat with a person like that. And there seems to be a lot of railing going on these days. There's a difference between a righteous rebuke of somebody and railing. They're two different things. Rebukes are necessary. Rebukes are biblical. Rebukes are things that people need to hear sometimes and they're, when they're administered appropriately by the right people, by the right people involved. You know what, you know what is a big thing to rail? When, when people are talking about things that they don't have any knowledge of or firsthand knowledge of and they're just completely separated from situations altogether and they just decide, I'm just going to start railing on this person even though I don't have any personal in, you know, interaction with them and, and I'm just going to go ahead and just start going off on people I don't even know anything about. Or maybe I heard one person say something about them, so now I'm going to jump on this bandwagon and join the mob and let's torch this guy's house down without even knowing anything about it. I mean, this is an attitude that's starting to get per pervasive online. Now, this is talking about within the church, right? This is talking about, um, actually, it's not even necessarily within the church. He's giving it to the church, but he's saying, you know, don't keep company with the man. If you know someone that's a brother in Christ and they're just some railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, don't even eat with that person. 
I'm not going to hang out with those people. I'm going to get more into that. I just, I mean, this is just on the list. I, like I said, I wasn't planning on going into this one detail, but it's, it's an important detail. I mean, everything on this list is, is on the list for a reason because it's really bad. And it's infectious too, by the way. When people start seeing, oh, it's okay for this person to fornicate. Right. Well, then, I mean, it must not be that bad. No one's saying anything about it. No one's doing anything about it. They're still welcome here. The drunkard, well, I guess it's okay. I'll, I'll go out with the pastor after service and have a beer. Let's go get drunk. I mean, brother so-and-so is doing it. It must be just fine. They've been coming to church for a decade. Same thing with the railing. And look, don't think, oh, Pastor Burzins, what are you, going soft? No. This has nothing to do with going soft on anybody. Like I said, when, when a rebuke is necessary, a rebuke will be given. But what I care about is God's word, and what I care about is what's doing right in God's eyes, and I'm not going to just try to impress people by how much I could rail on somebody so I could get a bunch of people to say, oh, yeah, right on, yeah, you really told him. And then just, just tag a bunch of other people on faith. Hey, look at this guy. Let's get this guy. Amen. And just rail on people. Amen. It's disgusting. That's right. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. All those sins that you mentioned here, this is wicked. Wicked. Things. No matter how acceptable or tolerated they are in the world, like covetousness, that's completely acceptable in this world. It ought not to be in church. It ought not to be among the brethren. So these are all passages so far we've looked at. Turn if you would to um, turn if you would to First Corinthians eleven. So I'll just stay in First Corinthians. These are all things that people can do within the church, among brethren, that you have conflicts with people, this is how you deal with it. Someone's in serious sin, this is how the church deals with it. Okay? Now we're going to look at dealing with heretics or heresy. Now, heresy and heretics is not even mentioned that many times in the Bible. There's only a few references to it overall. I mean, you look up heresies, heresy, heretic. Heretic is only used one time. So, The definition to the best that I've been able to determine, this isn't necessarily talking about someone who's automatically a false prophet. Now, false prophets teach heresies? Yes, they do. And is someone who's labeled a heretic, though, um, they're not always a false prophet. But the heresy goes along with, it's basically, it's, it's, it's teaching that goes against good, sound, solid doctrine as laid out in Scripture. That's, that's what heresy is. So, in Acts, I'll just read this for you. In Acts 24, the Apostle Paul says that, that he practices heresy according to the Jews. Right? So the Pharisees, the Jews, they thought Jesus Christ was a heretic. They thought that, oh, you're blaspheming God by the things that he was teaching and saying when, in fact, it was truth, right? I mean, it, it, was, it was obviously um, right and whatever. They were wrong, but they called him a heretic. So the way the Apostle Paul said in Acts 24, 14, says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. So the heresy that he was referring to is that he believed that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and that he was, he was the son of God. The Jews thought of that as heresy. And that's the reason why he even brings up, hey, they believe in a resurrection too, I just believe that Jesus, you know, resurrected. But they call that heresy, his, his belief that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. That's an example of something that, you know, again, it's not, it's not heresy because it's truth, but it's something that other people can view as it's, it's a major doctrinal problem. Because that's a major foundation in the Jewish religion. You know, that was something, whoa, you're, you're really going against a strong foundation of their religion. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, look at verse number 17. 
Now, and I think everyone here pretty much knows this, but the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. I mean, you read First and Second Corinthians, there is just one, just, just one thing after another, after another, after another, where Apostle Paul is really trying to get rid of a lot of problems within that church, more so than any of the other epistles to the you know, letters to the other churches. Corinth really had a, a, a lot of things to get right. And um, so he says here in verse number 17 of 1 Corinthians 11, he says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worst. So he's saying, like, I'm not praising you. Know, you're coming together not for the better. You know, when the church comes together, it should be edifying. You should be exhorting one another. You should, you know, people should be getting better and do, you know, and, and do more. It should be a benefit. It should, it's, a, it, it's, it's a good thing to become a church. But you're coming together for the worse. That's how bad things had gotten. Like, I'm not praising you for this. I'm calling you out. You can come together. It's not for the better, for the worse. Verse number 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So your church is split. You got people divided on doctrine, divided on other things. He says, verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So he's saying the reason why you're, he hears the divisions and he's like, I, I probably believe that. You guys are divided. And because you're divided, there must also be heresies there too. Because that's what heresies end up doing within the church. Is they're going to cause division. Because what happens is you get someone, the heretic, who's spreading around their heresy. They're contradicting the established doctrine of the church, which becomes then the heresy. And it's important enough to start dividing people. Now, I'll say this right now. I don't believe that a heresy has to necessarily do just with salvation, but it does have to attack a founding principle, you know, a real fundamental principle in the Bible. And we're going to see an example of that in, um, turn if you would to, yeah, I'll get in this. Turn if you would to 2 Peter chapter, no. Where is that? Yeah, that's going to get too far ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, turn, if you would, to, to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But one of the things that was, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So let's, let's keep going here. I'm going to read for you from Galatians chapter 5. You're in Titus chapter 3. Galatians 5.19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Now, this list if you notice in Galatians 5, it has a list of the, you know, the works of the flesh, but they're not just in random order. They're in an order that makes sense where they're, they're correlated with the, with, the word, you know, with the words next to it. So what I mean by that is he says, which are these? Adultery, fornication. Are those exactly the same thing? No. Are they extremely closely related? Yes, they are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. All of those are tied in with like a sexual immorality. They have a common theme, right? And he puts them all together. And he says, idolatry, witchcraft. Makes sense that those are together, right? Then hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, fighting, seditions is where people are, are up, upending authority, right? You're, if someone's making sedition, they're, they're, they're kind of causing turmoil over the, whoever has authority over them. And then heresies. So the wrath, that extreme anger, fighting, seditions, and heresies all go together. Heresies or heretics, this is, a, this is an important subject. This is something that the Bible talks about, like, and it's not something that should just be thrown around loosely. Like I said, it's not always necessary salvation, but I still think, I mean, this is... This is a heretic or heresies in the Bible is a serious thing. 
And it says, um, then it goes on, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You're in uh, Titus chapter 3. So we're going to see how to, I mean, we see that, okay, heresies, that's a, that's a big problem. They have a big deal. And we see it's listed in the works of the flesh. And of those works of the flesh that are listed, we saw a bunch of things that we also saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Right? Mm -hmm. The ones that, that says not to eat mm -hmm. with someone. There's a, there's a lot mentioned in that list that, that it's, they overlap. Mm -hmm. Titus chapter 3, verse number 9. We're going to see the only mention of a heretic now the person who's actually spreading the heresies, someone who's promoting heresy. Verse number nine says in Titus three, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they're unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. What's he saying? A person that's, that's an heretic, so you reject that person. You give them one or two admonitions because you're trying to correct them, right? But if the heretic isn't going to receive correction, they're, just, they're, they're wrong. They've got some core heresies that they're, that they're promoting, that they're teaching. You, you try to correct them. You give them one or two admonitions. And then he says, you reject them. Now, and it says, knowing that he that, that is such is subverted. They've subverted themselves and sin it, being condemned of himself. Look, the situation he's in now, that's on him. Again, does that say that you just have to follow the heretic everywhere and just go after the heretic and just make, li you know, just make sure it's your duty to make life miserable for that person? No. Now, do you want to warn people about a heretic? Absolutely. You know, you want, you, want, you, you want to be able to give a warning just to say, hey, here's this person who's a teacher and wants to be, you know, pastoring or teaching people or whatever. And especially when they're acting in a public, especially when they're acting in a public manner and trying to get followers and teaching and stuff, you say, hey, don't be deceived by this guy. He's a heretic. And that's appropriate. And... The, the rebuke can be strong and stern, and absolutely, it's warranted and it's right. But there, there comes a point where he says, I mean, that's why he says the first and second admonition. You know, you, first of all, you don't waste a bunch of time with them. I mean, the heretic, if you're just going to continually argue and go back and forth and say, no, I'm really going to show them why this is right. Look, no, God says, don't even waste your time. They're subverted. Because if they're not listening to a couple of clear scriptures that you're trying to show them, then it doesn't matter how many scriptures you show them. They're subverted. Avoid them. Avoid them. Just, just like you avoid the foolish questions, avoid the genealogies, it's unprofitable and vain. There's no point to it. Mark the heretic, avoid them, and, and be done with them. Why even give more attention to the heretic? Just let them be subverted and God will deal with them. Warn people about them that need to be warned, and that's it. But we don't want to get obsessive about it either. Amen. And I think some people have a problem just, just obsessing over it. It's like, look, it's dealt with. And, and again, you know, I'm not going soft on anybody in particular. This isn't even about anyone in particular. It's just, this is how the Bible says to deal with it. And nowhere does it say that a heretic has to automatically, turn if you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, that a heretic automatically has to be somebody who's not saved. There are people that get saved that, that get into false doctrine. Otherwise, we wouldn't be admonished to not get into false doctrine, you know, to, to, to keep our doctrine pure and to stay right and all this other stuff because that's why the Bible talks about people who are carried about with every wind of doctrine. Because they get deceived. Because they don't know that. They don't have much wisdom. They don't have much knowledge, but they get deceived. Doesn't mean they're unsaved. Just means they're carried about because they don't have a root down. They're not solid and know what they believe or why they believe it. 
It doesn't mean a person like that that's carried out with every wind of doctrine can't try to start teaching people and be a heretic. But that's how you deal with it. Now, the false prophet is a step up, I believe, from the heretic. They, they could be one in the same or not. 2 Peter chapter 2 is all about false prophets, just as Jude is. And if you want to make the claim of someone being a false prophet, that is a serious claim to make. Because according to the Bible, false prophets, they're damned. They are reprobate concerning the faith. The, the use of the term false prophet is someone who they've, they are just completely blinded and completely unsaved and just totally reprobate. And um, if you're going to make a claim about someone like that, you ought to have good evidence to make that type of a claim. I was talking about that with Brother Robert earlier today because it, it is something that should not just be thrown around loosely by anybody. I mean, even heretics shouldn't just be thrown around loosely. But calling someone a heretic and calling someone a false prophet are two different things. Now, some people that are unlearned in Scripture don't even know the difference. Don't even understand that you're calling someone a false teacher or a false prophet has some serious ramifications of what you're alleging about that person and possibly railing about somebody because you're bringing up a false railing accusation calling someone a false prophet that could very well be a believer. Right. And what you need to be able to do is to have consistency and understand the differences between your brother that sins, a heretic, and a false prophet. And look, they, they warrant different responses and different levels of rebuke and different levels of warning other people as well. So some things are appropriate for a false prophet that may not be appropriate for a saved brother who is teaching heresy. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Now, this is a, a specific type of heresy. This is a damnable heresy because this does have to do with, with uh, salvation. This is damnable. Even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. When you have someone who's a false prophet, they are inwardly wolves wearing sheep's clothing and they are out to destroy and, to, you know, and just to do damage. A person like that is like, open up the flood, floodgates and unload on someone like that to get the point across and to let everybody know, you know, we're not holding back. This person is a false prophet. They need to be aware of how wicked this person is and, and is, it's righteous to give, to give a lot more time invested to, to just warning everybody with, with, you know, very strong language because it's a very serious person to watch out for. It could do a lot of damage. Not that a heretic, just, you know, someone who's not a false prophet, but just is kind of involved in heresy, isn't a big deal, because it is, and people should be warned about that, but there's, there's a difference, I think, in, in how, what's appropriate for, for how much you go after someone like that or expose them. Um, and see, what, what's weird about all of this stuff is, is that it, it wasn't that big of a deal to understand how to deal with these things when it's all kept locally. You got independent churches. Oh, this person's teaching heresy. We deal with them. You know, oh, this guy in town is a false prophet. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to make sure the whole town knows that this guy's a false prophet. Right? I mean, that would make sense. Just make sure everyone's aware this guy's a wolf in sheep's clothing and he's trying to destroy you because you're trying to help all the people in your community that you care and you love and you don't want to see them get destroyed. But now it's like, man, everything's going on the internet and it's like, you know, people just completely removed, have nothing to do with you, with your town, with your church. And it's like, all this stuff is starting to, to blur some lines. Now, if you guys haven't noticed, I don't really do much on the internet at all when it comes to social media and things like that. And that is... Very deliberate, <laughs> because 
while it can be, while we do post things on Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that for benefit, to, to try to use a tool to benefit people and to, and to help people out, and you know, we got a lot of people that listen and, and are edified by the teachings. I just, there's something about just the forum of everybody throwing in their two cents and, and everyone having an opinion and everyone, you know, and then you get people fighting and striving that are supposedly brothers and sisters in Christ and just, I'm going to draw my line in the sand and I'm going to dig in and we're going to have it out on the keyboard over whatever doctrine that you want to fight about. And I see it starting to become toxic. And, you know, I'm, I'm totally not even there. This sermon's going way, way over time. But um, it needs to be said. If I were an outsider looking in to a lot of the conversations and things that I see on Facebook, I would want to have nothing to do with the independent fundamental Baptist movement. That's right. If I was an unbeliever or maybe a brand new Christian... And I see the things that people are saying and the way that they're fighting back and forth, one with another, and calling names and railing, and it's the spirit of destruction. I'll have nothing to do with that. Amen. I want to go to church where people are going to encourage me. I want to go to church where it's okay to ask a question and not get railed on for asking a legitimate question, where it's okay for people to want to know Hey, I'm not involved in this situation. I'm not just going to listen to one man's testimony and automatically gather up my torch and pitchfork and go after someone just because one person said something, no matter who that person is. Amen. We're supposed to be teaching people to think for themselves, to think rationally, to be able to, to look at things and make a judgment call, make a righteous judgment call. And if you don't have all the facts, if you're not involved with something, how could you even have a righteous judgment? And then you get people jumping in on someone else who wants to just wait and say, you know what, I just want to see all the facts. What's the problem with that? Right. It's not that you're calling one person a liar. It's just, I just want to know what's going on. And I want to make a decision for myself and not just automatically, cultishly rely on someone else to do all my thinking for me. It's, it, it is so unnerving. And it's sad to see the infighting and, and, and just the toxicity level of what's going on. And it's almost like people are trying to impress each other with how vile they can get in their comments. It is wicked. And that's what railing does in it. And I think the, the internet is a perfect form for that to foment and just to get worse and worse and worse. I'm going to blow through some. I have a lot of material. I probably should have preached this this morning and this evening just so I'm looking where the time is. Turn, if you would, to Romans 16 because this is also important when it comes to you know, marking people. Now, there are people that cause divisions and are subversive. And this is part of what a heretic can do too, right? They're, they're going in and they're, they're, they're preaching their heresies to try to cause division within a church. Uh, Romans 16, verse number 17, the Bible reads, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. So when you find people that is just causing divisions, causing offenses, you know, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, which would be the established sound doctrine, so someone promoting heresy without actually using the word heresy, it says, you know, because they're causing divisions, using teaching or doctrine contrary to what's established. Mark them and avoid them. So you say, this person is causing problems, they're being subversive, they've got a, a heretic, they're the heretic doctrine, they're a heresy, I'm going to mark them, this is who they are, and I'm going to avoid them. I'm not going to have anything to do with that person until they get right with God. And when I see a heretic, you know what, I'm not going to be praying for them and, joy and yoking up with them. I'm going to mark them and avoid them. And if I do pray for them, it's going to be, I pray that they get right, that they repent. 
I pray that they have godly sorrow that worketh repentance, but I'm not going to feel sorry for them. If you're going around causing division and preaching heresy, you deserve what you get. It's a bottom line. But they ought to be marked and avoid, avoided because that's damaging for the church. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Philippians 3, 7. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Philippians 3, 17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is rebellion, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now he's saying, look, mark the people who are doing good things to, to have them as an example, because... There's other people that are enemies of the cross of Christ that are out there trying to cause division. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 14, the Bible says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Put them in remembrance that you don't fight about words to no profit, right? The heretic... First and second admonition reject because anything after that, it's not going to be profitable, but to the subverting of the hearers. It's just going to cause more you know, subversion of other people. The more you just continually go back and forth with these people, give them an opportunity and an outlet to just continue their heresies and have other people watch. That's why we don't debate. Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Right. Yeah, that's shunning. So you have nothing to do with that. We're avoiding it. We're marking it. We have nothing to do with it. We're not going to tolerate it. We're not going to listen to it. End of story. Shut it out altogether. If you're shutting something out altogether, does that mean you just continually rehash it and bring it up over and over and over and over again and just continually get people interested? Well, what is this person saying? Or do you say, they're shunned. We're done with it. We're going to stop the damage here. And, and, you know, and you know what's going on? And these, these are all for people and how the churches should be run. Because on the internet, it's the Wild West anyways. There is no church on the internet. It's wide open. I can't protect people from the internet, but I can protect people in the church. And tell people, this person's marked, they're a heretic, avoid it. Done. Problem solved. If someone's very public, a public figure, publicly teaching, we could use our avenue of, of publicly proclaiming, this person's a heretic, avoid this person, have nothing to do with them, to, to try to get as many people to, to see that as possible, and then done. Move on. I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend all my time just continuing. And, and look, I'm going to reiterate this. This is not against any of the ways that, that the pastors have been dealing with, you know, individual pastors I know that are my friends and people that, that, that I think are completely right on the way that they've handled the situation. It's not a, a slam on any of them. Not at all. Because I haven't seen inappropriateness off of, out, of, out of them, but I have seen a lot of other people People I don't even know. I mean, honestly, I, people I've never met, people I don't know, but a lot of people I just see names popping up over and over and over again, and it's just kind of like... Why? And, and like I said before, if I were to see this stuff, I would, I would be completely turned off. I would have nothing to do with it. Who wants to get involved? You know, we're supposed to be involved. We're supposed to be soldiers for Christ, right? And this is one of the reasons why I preached this sermon a couple weeks ago. You know, are you a soldier for Christ? There's a time to be a soldier. There's time to be in a battle. We're supposed to be fight, yeah, fight against the heretic, fight against the false prophet, fight against the spiritual wickedness in high places. But we shouldn't be fighting amongst, each, amongst ourselves and amongst each other and getting so wrapped up in the fight that you're, oh man, you must be, you know, like, like reading into every single little thing that someone says and you must be on their side and turn this into a us versus them, like within the church. Now you see how the heresy causes division? Because there's already people being sucked into this and saying, oh, you said one thing admonishing someone else just to, why don't you just hear everything? And now, oh, you must be on their side. Right. No, I just want people to think for themselves. 
and not have a cult-like mentality of just walking off the end of the earth because you're following somebody. You in 2 Timothy chapter 2? So I believe we just read for, uh, chapter, uh, verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness and their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So here we see the Apostle Paul naming names and saying Hymenaeus and Philetus. These guys, watch out for them. I'm marking them for you right now. And these are the people that you should shun their profane and vain babblings. But look at what they did here. I mean, this is, this is their heresy, verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So this teaching about the resurrection was serious enough to call them out by name and for them to be marked and avoided. It's a good example of someone that, of something someone can do in order to be marked and avoided. And the resurrection is pretty serious. The resurrection, I mean, that does have to do with our salvation. The fact that Jesus Christ was saying, oh, but this isn't talking about that Jesus rose. See, these people might very well have said, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus, he rose from everything. But the future resurrection, that's already passed. That's, that's what they were teaching. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there because the Apostle Paul isn't giving them any credit at all. And he's calling them out and saying they're subverting people. But think about this. If you were around during that time, I'm sure there was the Hymenaeus and Philetus sympathizers saying, oh, well, I can see how they believe that because, do you remember this? When Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, that there were some people that, that did come out of the graves and walked around. Do you remember that? And the resurrection story? So you can say, oh, well, I mean, that... These people came back, so the, the resurrection must have already happened. But he says, no, of course that's ridiculous because if you know Scripture, that's not what it's talking about at all. That's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not the few, that second coming when we're all going to be changed, where, you know, in a moment, a twinkling of an eye, you know, all this stuff that he knew. And it, so he's not, he's not giving them any credit at all or any sympathy. He's just saying, mark them, avoid them. They've got vain babblings and weird teachings and just have nothing to do with them. And not for a second saying, oh, well, I see how you can think this. You know, no, it's a damnable, or, you know, in this case, yeah, it was a damnable heresy. And this isn't the first time he called out Hymenaeus either. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he said in verse 18, this charge, I, uh, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou, mightest, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So again, here's another, you know, Hymenaeus coming up again earlier, saying, I delivered him unto Satan already. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, where you're at, look at verse number 19, he says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Again, just, just things to avoid here in 2 Timothy 2.23. Avoid the foolish questions and the unlearned questions, knowing that they do gender strifes. It's going to cause just fightings. That's what a strife is. You're just fighting over stupid questions. Don't, allow, don't, don't, don't get involved in some fight with someone who's just bringing up stupid questions. It's not even worth it. If someone were to ask me, a fool, you know, some foolish question about like, you know, have you ever heard of the serpent seed doctrine or something? How this, how, you know, it's like, that's a foolish question. I'm sorry. That's just stupid. I'm not going to get wrapped up in a fight with someone over that because I'm just going to avoid them and say, we'll see you. Yeah. I mean, you're just subverted. Right. And, and, you know, I'll give you one or two admonitions maybe and that's it because I'm not going to get in some fight with you in gender strifes. I'm just going to move on to something. You know, in that case, I just move on to salvation and just be like, I'm not going to get involved with your 
your stupid argument, your stupid question. But look at verse 24. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance and acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. This goes to the spirit of how we ought to be teaching people. Now, rebuking someone and telling them that they're wrong is not an easy way of doing that, necessarily, because no one wants to hear that. But he's saying we shouldn't just be getting involved in all these fights with the foolish and unlearned questions and the people that are bringing this stuff up. Now, I just want to point this out too. This is not talking about dealing with Hymenaeus. This is a different person here. This is not, he's not just continuing on about Hymenaeus. This is a different subject. It's just about people who bring up you know, bring up maybe some dumb questions or whatever. He's saying, um, as a servant of the Lord, you're not, you're not out to just get into fights over all, you know, over all these different things that people want to fight about over all these doctrinal issues and just have these, these, these all-out fights. He's saying you should be gentle, apt to teach. If you really want to teach someone something, you're not going to teach somebody by calling them an idiot. How are you going to get someone to listen to you by name calling and everything else? And just you're, all you're doing is going to be fomenting a strife, a fight. But if you really think that you're right and someone else is wrong about something that's doctrine, well, why don't you patiently and meekly instruct those that oppose themselves? That's the proper way to do it, especially among the brethren. Because God might give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, the Bible says. God might just open up their eyes and see it when you have the right spirit about showing it to them. Right. Everything should be done in the proper spirit. I'm almost done. I mean, not according to my notes, but I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> I brought this up before, but it's worth bringing up again about the, 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 you know, when Jesus said, you know now what manner of spirit you are of. And that's found in Luke chapter 9. Don't turn it. I'm just going to go over this because I've, I've read this before. But in Luke chapter 9, I have in my notes verses 51 through 56. You can go back and read that later. When they were looking to go to Jerusalem and they entered into a village of the Samaritans. They're going through Samaria to Jerusalem and they just wanted to find a place to stay. And they were refused a place to stay. And the disciples of Jesus said, Master, you know, shall we call down fire from heaven like Elijah did? I went over this in our Wednesday night Bible study. But he says, You know not what manner of spirit you're of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. They got all zealous and worked up over what Elijah did. Elijah did was in a completely different scenario than these people are in. People online see things where there's someone in a scenario that directly impacts them and they have first-hand knowledge of things and they're dealing with someone directly and, and making things public, their situation that they're in, that is absolutely correct and warranted and whatever. But then people outside of that situation think that it's righteous then for them to have the same spirit that this other man of God had, even though their situation is completely different. And they have nothing to do with that situation or whatever. You know, it's, a, it's, it's looking at the Elijah and saying, well, he called fire down from heaven, so let's just call fire down from heaven over anybody who disagrees with us. Right. And that was the spirit that you're not supposed to have, right. according to Jesus. Amen. Oh, they wouldn't let us stay. What did he say before when he sent them out two and two when they wouldn't receive him? We went over this story this morning. Shake the dust off your feet and move on to the next town. He didn't say call fire down from him. He said, don't worry about it. God will take care of that when they don't, when they don't you know, receive you into their houses. God will take care of that. You don't need to go bringing judgment upon people like that. All right. Turn if you were to Proverbs 17. I'm going to close with this. I have in my notes to go over Galatians 1 because when you're dealing with people and, and when, you know, calling people out or whatever, Galatians 1 is very clear. When someone presents a false gospel, 
that they're to be cursed. And it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, if someone's preaching a false gospel, that is, that is like one of the most serious things that you can do. So if you have someone, he says, though we are an angel from heaven. So it doesn't matter if it's the Apostle Paul. It doesn't matter if you see an angel, if they're, pre if they're preaching any other gospel than that you've received, he said, let them be accursed. He says it twice. Let them be accursed. That's an appropriate way to deal with people. But that's, again, cursing someone for preaching a false doctrine, I mean, not, you know, for preaching a false gospel is different than cursing someone for teaching some other heresy or some other false doctrine. It's not the same. So it doesn't warrant the same response. They're two different things. Too often I see the spirit in which something is... Like, just to, to wrap things up, you're in Proverbs 17. I just want to close on this. And, and you know what? I thank God that our church is already pretty good about this. Really good about this. But... Um, I'm bringing it up because it's so easy to get wrapped up into it, and I don't want anyone getting wrapped up into the fights and debates and, and this, the bad spirit, really, that's going around and the witch hunts on the Internet. I really, I really hate social media in general just because of all the bad things that come from it. Like I said, it's not, it's not you know, it in, in and of itself is, is not the problem. It's people that... <laughs> That, that user of the problem, but um, the things that I've noticed too often, you know, the spirit, first of all, in which something is said is not conveyed in writing very well. A lot of people type things really quick, and I have this problem even at work. It's not even social media, but I communicate with people via text messages or instant messages, and people, two people can start getting really angry at each other because the way that you read something sounds accusatory, it's, you, know, it, you, you get this impression that they're saying it a certain way because when you read it, like, it's like you're, you're putting a tone in their voice that doesn't exist because it's in text. And oftentimes people could just say things or even just be joking and it's completely received the wrong way because you don't get all of the nonverbal communication. You don't get the intonations. You don't get the the, the, the eyes and the hands motion and everything else that when you're speaking with someone face to face, you would get right. and communicate that much more clearly. Right. All you're seeing is what's written there. So unfortunately, just because of that medium and people type really fast too. So sometimes it can be really short or terse looking when it's not meant to be that way. So right off the bat, you have a tendency to get people on edge and get in battle mode or defense mode just because of the medium it's going through. Because who wants to spend an hour typing up some long, eloquent thing that really conveys what you're trying to say as opposed to just writing out a sentence or two, which is very insufficient to communicating everything that you're thinking or trying to, to, to talk about or whatever. But not only that, there's people that say things that they would never say face-to-face -face in a real conversation. People have a tendency to, get to, just, to just let things go too much and, and be inappropriate with the things that they say. I'm not going to let that happen again. Not tonight, at least. With the things that, that happen, you know, it's like, look, the way that you would deal with someone when you speak to them, that's the way you ought to present yourself on the internet, too. Right. I mean, if you're willing to say something, you should be able to say the exact same thing when they're standing in front of you. Yeah. And things would be way better off if people could just follow that one rule for themselves. Yeah. But then thirdly, it's the ganging up, even on brethren, the brother, you know, people who are supposedly saved and, and like-minded and everything else, that just ask questions or have a different perspective on something. And it's like, I can only imagine what it may look like to an outsider looking in. Why would I want to be a part of this group? What spirit are you of? We're in a spiritual battle. And that's true. But you shouldn't love strife and fighting. Some people really love it. And they're just looking to get in a fight all the time. And if you're not looking to get in a fight all the time, they're going to call you weak. And I don't care. People, you call me weak. on an, you know, Go ahead, call me weak. I don't care. Because <laughs> what I care about is what the Bible says and what God thinks about my behavior. Amen. That's what I care about. I want to do what's right. I want to be an example for other people to follow. 
I'm not going to tolerate sin and wickedness. And if there's people that, that have extreme sin and wickedness and damnable heresies and things like that in our church, I'm going to deal with it appropriately. They're going to be cast out. I'm going to protect the people here. I'm not going to be soft on it. I'm not going to, going to, you know, go easy on people in that regard. But I'm also not going to be going out looking for a fight with everyone and everything and anything anyone says about me if, if I don't agree with them and everything. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 19, he loveth transgression that loveth strife. If you like fighting, you like sin, is what that's saying right there. And he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. Jump down to verse 27, because you see, most people need to know when to stay out of things that have nothing to do with you. But everyone wants to throw in their own two cents into every situation and just throw themselves in there and, and get involved. The fight that doesn't even concern you just observers just, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add my own two cents in there too. For what purpose? Just to stir the pot a little bit and to get more people riled up? Verse 27, he that hath knowledge spareth his words. He that hath knowledge spareth his words. Does that mean you just keep on going on and talking and talking and talking and talking and I'm just going to respond to everybody? No. Spare your words withhold your words. If you have knowledge, you're going to spare your words. And a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. This has to do with the type of spirit that you have. Are you going to get involved in every fight that doesn't belong to you and just add your two cents everywhere? Not if you're wise. Not if you have an excellent spirit. There's a lot of things. I know what's right and wrong. And I can see, I can make the judgment already what's right and wrong. But you know what? I'm not going to get involved in every stupid online debate and fight that's out there. And just join that fight. Because You know why? Because I don't love fighting. I'll fight when I need to fight. I'll fight the battles that are important and that need to be fought. But I'm not just going to go and fight amongst the brethren. And I'm not going to exert authority over people that are not God under my God-given authority within this church. And within the realm and scope of that authority within this church. Verse 28, even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, it means when he doesn't talk. Even if they're a fool and you hold your peace, he's counted as wise. People will look at that fool that just because he's not saying anything, they say, wow, that person must be pretty wise. Why? Because a wise person knows how to hold his peace. Let the fools go off and babble one to each other and, and get involved in these debates and fights and arguments and sow discord and everything else. Forget them. I don't care about it. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Last verse, Proverbs 26, 17. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. If you don't have a dog or don't know anything about this, when you take a, you know, I don't recommend doing this. <laughs> when you take a dog by the ears, dogs don't like that. Dogs don't like you messing with their ears. You pay attention to this. You're the ear puller in my family. <laughs> I've got a daughter that likes to, to hold, to tug on ears, on, on people ears, which, which that's fine. But dogs, you grab their ears you better, you better be wearing some strong gloves or something because they're going to bite your hand off. They do not want you doing that. And when say, the Bible's saying that when you, you're passing by, right? This isn't your fight. Someone didn't approach you. You're not confronting someone else. You're just passing by and say, hey, there's these people fighting over here. I think I'm just going to get involved. I'm just going to start meddling in this fight that's not my fight. So you do that, you're just like taking a dog by the ears. You're just looking to hurt yourself. What's the point? Be careful because you know what? It can be tempting because you want to set everybody else straight. You want to tell everyone else why they're wrong. And you're wrong and you're wrong and you're wrong. You don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. What's the point? People need to get in their local churches, sit down, shut up, listen to some teaching, be taught. You don't have to agree with every single thing that the pastor says. But a lot of people out there really need to get some learning and get some wisdom and learn how to hold their tongue and not get involved in everybody else's fight that doesn't belong to them. 
I'm all for calling out false prophets and heretics when it's appropriate, when, when it needs to be done, when people need to be aware of it. Absolutely. Amen and amen. But you know what? When, there's, when the fight really has nothing to do with me, I'm not going to get involved. When the message has already sufficiently been put out there, what, why, why do I need to do it too? Why is anyone, you know, it's, there's no point to it. What's appropriate? I'm going to watch out for this church because this is what, what God has given me the job over. I'm not the pastor of the internet. I'm going to use it for a tool. If I need to use it to, to, to warn people, I'll do it. I'm not going to go soft on things that, that shouldn't be dealt with softly. Be hard on the things that need to be dealt with hardly. We, we saw a lot of examples from Scripture on that. But let's do things appropriately and remember what spirit we're of ultimately. It's not about a soft versus hard thing. You could, you could be strong and not back down and still have a, a, a way of saying things and, and dealing with things that you know, isn't just causing more problems. I don't know. I mean, we live in the world we live in. It's what we got. You know, and I, I don't even think I would choose to just have, you know, if social media shut down. I mean, I, I'm all for freedom. Let people do what they want to do. But I think people need to get some smarts and, and get some wisdom and, uh, and, and learn how to behave themselves appropriately. Just as much as you know how to behave yourself in a, in a church setting, just as much as, you, you know, your parents should have taught you how to behave yourself out in public when you go out to places. You know, some of the things that you do at home aren't appropriate out in public. Well, guess what? Some of the things that you think in your head aren't appropriate just to be barfed out onto the internet and just put out there for everybody to see. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, uh, for your words. I pray that you would please help our, our church to have the, the proper spirit, dear Lord. And, and Lord, not just our church, but people who, who are like-minded believers that are brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you would please um, help us not to bring a bad name on, on, on you, dear Lord, because of our sin and our strives and fightings and, and, uh, and, and the, these people get caught up in, in so much of that, dear Lord. Um, we don't want to drive people away. I mean, we need to stand up for what's right, but God, I pray that you would please just give people discernment and knowing when, uh, when it's even appropriate to get involved in stuff. And, and uh, pray that you please just, just guide us and direct us, dear Lord, and help us to make appropriate judgments. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.